American National Insurance Company brings you the following interview, already in progress. Why do you need life? All right, welcome everyone. My name is Evan Clark. I'm executive director of Atheists United. We're a Los Angeles-based nonprofit that serves atheists, agnostics, humanists, secular people across California. And we thank you for joining today. This is our, uh, yeah, God, what are we in the eighth month now of online meetings, I believe, since COVID hit. And uh, we've been doing these meetings on the fourth Sunday of the month for 37 years now. And we thank you for joining us. And we're thrilled to have you here for an incredible talk today. I have some quick announcements. We'll move into our meeting. We have uh, an atheist minute. We always start our meeting for meeting with, and then we move to our main speaker presentation. So uh, let's see if I can just get this going. So I have a quick announcement. It's Atheist United's birthday this month. Um, if you didn't know, Atheist United was established in 1982. We are Southern California's uh, most active and longest running atheist organization. Uh, we just turned 38 as of now. So if you'd like to celebrate Atheist United, I have an incredible way you could do that. Normally we'd have a huge party in person. We'd be in a theater with our friends, family, speakers, members, um, but instead we're virtually staying safe, which is wonderful. But one way you can support us for our birthday is you can check out a matching gift campaign we've got going. Two of our donors, two of our members saw that we have tripled the amount of community service work we've been doing since COVID-19 hit. We have become one of the most active giving back organizations in LA, especially in the atheist community. And because of all the great work we've been doing, these members stepped up and they said, we wanna offer $2,500 in a matching gift campaign, which means every dollar you give to Atheist United is going to be matched for the next 30 days. So please, 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 if you've been considering a gift to an atheist organization, if you'd love to see us continue our work, if you wanna invest in more service work, more outreach, more community activism by the atheist community, please donate. Um, I know it says October 31st. Um, I posted that before I thought about when the election was and how much that's sucking up everyone's time and money right now. We are gonna extend that date a little bit. Um, but I'd love to hit this $2,500 match before the 31st. So if you'd like to help us get there, please visit our website, atheistunited.org. Check out our post or two on Facebook about it. Um, there's lots of ways to give, but we really want to hit this, hit this match. These are tough times for nonprofits. Uh, normally, we raise about $250 per meeting in person at these types of gatherings, and we've completely lost that revenue this year. So we'd love your help hitting this match, but please visit atheistunited.org. Great. I'm going to get rid of this share screen. Let's see, stop sharing. And I'm going to introduce our Atheist Minute for today. Our Atheist Minute is a short story, short, uh, short presentation, essentially by a member of our community to talk about their atheist experience, their atheist story, or anything relating to their atheism that they find interesting and want to share with the larger world. Today, we have Louis Campos, who's been a member since this year and one of our most active volunteers, I should say. He's been doing incredible work for us. And I'm gonna highlight his screen and let him take the floor. Go ahead, Louis. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you, Evan, for that uh, introduction. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, cool. As you stated, my, my name is uh, Louis Campos. I'm originally from the Central Valley, California. I just came to the community recently. My atheist story, I guess uh, I was raised Catholic. Um, roughly around the time when I was in eighth grade, I became, uh, began to be disillusioned with the notion of uh, eternity in an afterlife. And then later on in life, I came to, uh, just found it to be, um, irrational, it didn't seem reasonable, it didn't seem like something that was possible, it just didn't make scientific sense. So I kind of fell away and became a secularist. Um, I still kind of identify with some ways with Catholicism as my culturally, that's what we raised in a Chicano family. So there are a lot of things that are kind of hold, that are holdovers. And it's just, it's too much work for me to go and pick them all out and say, I'm no longer going to do this, that, and the other, just kind of fell away. Anyway, um, 
Uh, my beliefs are probably from, are influenced by uh, people like Schwanza, um, Aristotle, uh, Spinoza, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, uh, Donald Davidson, and Daniel Dennett are some of my influences. And um, yeah, so I just, this is something I've been, it's been a process. I'm not, I'm not strictly an atheist, I guess, but effectively I'm an atheist. And by strictly an atheist, I'm, I'm kind of a, a pantheist. I kind of believe as uh, Einstein did and Spinoza. So if you should meet me on the street and want to go into that, go ahead and talk to me about it. I'll be happy to do that. And um, I'm, I'm excited by a lot of the work that Atheist United is doing in the community. And I want to be a part of all of that because uh, service is something I believe in. It's a, it's a value. It's something that uh, my family is really strong on that. And um, it just instilled in me at a young age. So with that, that's my Atheist Minute. Have fun, guys. <laughs> hey, thank you, Louie. Appreciate it. Uh, if you would like to hang out with Louis sometime, Louis comes to our food distribution program we do every month on the third Friday. Uh, he has been super helpful. Uh, we did voter registration at our uh, last few food distributions and even helped some people sign up for the census, which was wonderful work. So thank you, Louis, for uh, your great work. Let's move this spotlight. Thank you. Uh, I am excited and thrilled to announce our speaker for today. I did write some notes down so I wouldn't screw it up. Let's see if I can get this right. Uh, Sarah Blaine, uh, Sarah, you can go ahead and set up your uh, share screen right now if you'd like. Uh, Sarah Blaine has more than 20 years of political and nonprofit advocacy experience and has dedicated her career to advancing social justice through public policy and grassroots community organizing. She served on the board of directors of Secular Coalition for Arizona, Secular Student Alliance, the Prescott Pride Center, Arizona Interfaith Movement. She was America's first state level atheist lobbyist in Arizona, and she was named Foundation Beyond Belief's Humanist Innovator of the Year in 2014. Currently, she serves as the senior strategist at Spectrum Experience LLC, which is America's first humanist political consulting firm. And she's the communication director for Foundation Beyond Belief, I've worked with Sarah off and on for almost what, like eight, 10 years now or something. Um, and it has been an absolute pleasure. With that, I will give you the virtual podium, uh, which I know you, you desire and go for it. I wish you still had the wooden podium for online talks. I know, well, and I like that I can hide behind it if I get really nervous too. It's very, you know, supportive. Now, right now I'm sitting on my bed with the computer on a stack of pillows, so. Anything can go wrong. <laughs> oh, okay. It's uh, to mute yourself, Tom. There won't be any interruptions. Um, my family is all home right now, so I'm kind of hiding out in the bedroom. But uh, but hopefully we'll have some sm smooth sailing here. Um, I really appreciate you having me uh, here to talk about such a relevant topic. I think that anybody who's paying attention at all uh, feels kind of the unique weight. Uh, and darkness of the times that we're living in. We've got COVID, the economic crash, uh, the backlash against the black liberation movement, the climate. I mean, I don't have to tell you, um, but I will to set the scene. Uh, slide. Okay, my slides are working, yes. Okay, so <laughs> people, People are really struggling right now, right? Um, nearly one in four households have experienced food insecurity this year. And that's even before COVID, uh, more than 10% of US households experienced food insecurity in the previous year, which is 35 million Americans who didn't have uh, enough food to eat or didn't know where their next meal was gonna come from. And that number has doubled as a result of COVID. And of course the impacts of COVID are staggering. We have Half a million people in the U.S. have been hospitalized from some point uh, with the virus, and a quarter million have died. And the pre-existing conditions for COVID-19 that worsen outcomes for communities of color, these have devastating impacts, even in the absence of the pandemic. 
And of course, the biggie, the one that dwarfs everything is climate catastrophe, which will result in millions of climate refugees in the coming years as cities become unlivable. And I, I just read that uh, researchers are estimating that an additional 150 million people, more people will die uh, each year for every single degree Celsius of warming that we have. Um, and then in addition to all of these massive public and political tragedies, we still have to deal with the everyday tragedies of just being human, like illness. This is my little sister, Alethea. She is one of the kindest, gentlest, most creative, funny people I've ever known. And she's undergoing radiation for a brain tumor, like nearly a million other Americans. This is my passionate, spunky teenage daughter, Lois who is learning to live with major depression, like nearly 300 million other people globally. And she did let me know I could share this with you. Uh, she's really passionate about wanting to end the stigma against mental illness. And this is my friend and colleague, Michael, a fearless advocate and ally for anyone experiencing marginalization throughout his entire career. And he died very suddenly this year um uh, losing him i mean the grief it's really it's brutal this all just sucks right it just hurts but one of the great things about humanism is that we don't have to pretend that it doesn't we don't have to try and realign our feelings of grief and despair with some kind of cosmic purpose we're not looking for a divine plan that promises good things for us, but keeps failing to deliver. We can take life as it really is. Uh, I remember several years ago, I was doing a community discussion at my home on death uh, and, and secular approaches to death. And a lot of the talk centered around trying to find meaning and beauty in death, the cycle of life, uh, giving our bodies to the earth, kind of the, the joy of life, knowing that you have to die. And there was a young teenage girl with us who had just lost her 20 something uncle to cancer. And she just suddenly burst out, why can't we just say that death fucking sucks? It doesn't mean anything. It just sucks. Well, we can, as humanists, we can say that. And saying it means that we can get straight to the process of grieving rather than trying to make sense of it or pretending to be happy that the people we lost are with God now. But then what? How do we endure and flourish when we know the truth is that the human experience is often just awful? I believe that humanism has extraordinary relevance in times of both personal and political darkness. The practice of, of humanism and its moral tools of reason, compassion, experience, and hope can be powerful in working against darkness. So usually when I present on humanism, I give pretty academic talks. I don't tell enough stories, I need more jokes. Um, I get overexcited about stuff like modifying utilitarian ethics with feminist care theory. But these times that we're in, they're personal for all of us. We're all struggling through the reality we're in, many of us in a deeply personal way. So I think that it makes sense for me to tell you a little bit about my personal journey to humanism and how I've come to see the practice of humanism as a source of strength for me. Okay. So a Methodist minister, an evangelical Christian, and a Hasidic Jew walk into a bar. Actually, that didn't happen. They weren't really bar people. They're my parents. That is my dad, my mom, and my Papa Shimon. Now, how this became my family is kind of a long story, but suffice to say, I grew up with parents who were very religious. Their religion, though, was very humanistic in many ways like the early humanists who wrote our first manifesto in the 30s and envisioned humanism as a new religion that had to formulate its hopes and plans in light of the scientific spirit. 
The religion of my parents was compassionate. It valued questions and lifelong learning. It didn't rely on divine intervention, although they all believed in that. They didn't teach us to wait for miracles, but to work for them. I remember my mom's maxim, uh, use your problem solving skills anytime I couldn't figure something out or uh, look it up and pointing us to the dictionary or the encyclopedia back in the olden times before the internet. Evan, you wouldn't know about those days, but they were dark times. My parents were involved in racial justice work, disability activism, and engaged in radical hospitality for anyone who needed a meal or a place to stay. All of the religions that they practiced were centered around human responsibility and on building intentional communities of support and care. These values made me a humanist, although I didn't know that word for a very long time. Probably the greatest gift of my life was being part of a family where my mom insisted that everybody belonged. Anyone who needed to eat, who needed a place to stay, who needed a hug, people who were struggling with addiction, who were hungry, depressed, lonely, homeless, all kinds of people were in our house all the time and they belonged there. And the power and possibility of being able to build community wherever I go has made me feel really at home in the humanist family, wherever I am. And this is humanism. But my childhood was not all good things and connection and possibility um, because of mental illness and violence in my house. As a teenager at a certain point, living at home wasn't an option anymore. So when I was about 16, I ended up not living anywhere. I did not realize that this was called homelessness until much later because I thought homelessness meant like sleeping on a park bench or under a bridge. Um, and I, ne I never had to sleep outside. But I stayed with a series of friends, co-workers from my work study job at McDonald's, family members, friends of family members, and boyfriends. I didn't always know where I would be sleeping from one night to the next. I felt like I was constantly begging and that my safety was based on whether or not I was lucky enough to find a good person to let me stay with them. And I witnessed and experienced a lot of truly terrible things during that time. But I was extraordinarily lucky. And here's what happened next. My junior year, right before I dropped out of high school to work more, I got a grant to go on a school trip to Washington, DC. Well, my mind was totally blown when I got there. As someone who'd been feeling really voiceless and powerless, I felt like this is where people go to be heard. This is how you can make change to get people's needs met. And I knew I really wanted to find a way into this world. So a couple of months later, mostly on a whim, I marched into my local congressman's office. Uh, I had a shaved head, combat boots, probably smelled bad. <laughs> um, congressman Bruce Bento from St. Paul, Minnesota. And I marched in there and asked if there was an internship or something I could do. And despite the fact that I was a homeless teenage high school dropout, the staff took the time to connect me with the campaign office where the campaign manager put me to work. That campaign staff loved me in an inexplicable way. They essentially wrapped themselves around me in a bubble of protection and care. They made absolutely sure that my life was gonna turn out okay. When she learned about the um, situation I was in, the campaign manager, Jane, started giving me a daily stipend for food and bus fare. The field manager, Eric, let me sleep on his couch. And uh, eventually he and his roommates let me rent a room in his house, which was a huge deal for me because I was too young to sign a lease. Most importantly, they treated me, a kid who felt really thrown away. They treated me like someone who was smart and valuable and who they believed would do big things with her life. So when that campaign was over, I had a home, I had a resume with references that included a US congressman, and I had a whole community who made up a safety net for me for decades after. When I look at the story of my life 
and how my outcomes are so different from many people who face the same challenges I have, this fact stands out the most. There were many people who chose to take responsibility for me when they didn't have to. They each participated in acts of compassion and care that were not required of them, but that they were inspired by their own consciences to do. And in doing this, they became powerful. They created a world of possibility for me. They gave me a life and therefore they gave my children a life. They gave possibility to everyone that I've ever helped or provided aid to. They've enabled every charitable donation I've ever made. All of this came from a few good people making the powerful and empowering decision to take human responsibility. And years later, when I uh, read Greg, Greg Epstein's book, Good Without God, and saw the word humanism for the first time, I knew that this power had a name. Now, there are many different definitions of humanism, and because we're not dogmatic, how we define our life stance is in a constant state of evolution. We can update our understanding of who we are as we learn more about the world and about ourselves. So this is my favorite one right now. It's kind of a combination I've taken from several that definitions that I've come across. Humanism means accepting that positive It means taking responsibility for improving the world for all life without reservation, using the tools of reason, compassion, experience, and hope. For me, humanism is defined by the action of taking responsibility for life. It's not just something that you think or believe, but it's what you do and how you engage with the world. It's how you actively cultivate caring relationships and erase arbitrary divisions between one another in our human family. And there's incredible power in this action. We live in a cold, dead, value neutral universe. If there's going to be any love in this void, if there's gonna be care, compassion, joy, it's because sentient beings create it. We are the source of all hope, all kindness, we are the light in the darkness. Creating that light isn't magic, it's work. Some of the most important work that humanists must do as part of, a part of our practice is to cultivate the moral tools that help us identify what our responsibilities are, and then that motivate us to act when we have the opportunity to do so. So I like to highlight the humanist tools of reason, compassion, experience and hope. I don't feel like it's hard to make a case for reason, right? Most of us understand that unchecked, uneducated emotions lead to the dangerous zealotries that we find in racism, nationalism, human supremacy, and other tribalisms. It's not hard to see that in our politics, our relationships, our philosophies, we need sound reasons for our arguments. We shouldn't, for example, deny people human rights based on arbitrary divisions like skin color or gender identity. We can use reason to uncover and confront our biases, to bravely know the truth about our universe and make decisions based in reality as we uncover it. And I think probably some of the most urgent work for humanists today is in confronting our biases because they cause so much harm. They're really insidious because they cloak themselves in the language of rationality. Like you probably know this one, right? I shouldn't give cash to a homeless person because they might spend that money on drugs and alcohol. Like substance abuse is a major factor in homelessness. It feels sound, right? We can find numbers that back up our biases against people experiencing homelessness. Yet the actual studies straight up show that when you give cash to unhoused people, they spend less on drugs and alcohol. They're also able to spend less time trying to get basic necessities like food and bus fare, and they can work on securing jobs and housing, which they do much more quickly than people who don't get a cash infusion. So our biases hurt people and prolong homelessness. 
confronting those biases, uh, biases allows us an opportunity to have a real impact to actually make positive change rather than just making ourselves feel positively. When I first started talking about humanism, I would refer to the rational and the compassionate as the head and heart of humanism, but that was actually a mistake. The heart really just pumps blood. And while I understand that using the heart to refer to compassion is just a metaphor, it's a bad one because the heart is an unthinking organ outside of the head. This metaphor subordinates compassion to reason by implying that they're totally separate, that compassion is a feeling with no cognitive content and that reason is the thing we do with our, co with our cognitive minds. But that is not an accurate representation. Empathy and compassion do have cognitive content Empathizing is the cognitive process of creatively reconstructing someone else's suffering. It's a way of providing context to rational facts that we might otherwise fail to understand fully. And the feelings empathy and compassion evoke inspire us to act. And this world needs us not just to be correct, but to act. Experience is simply awareness gained through encounter. Experience educates our emotions and points us to what is morally important. Because there's a difference, for example, between reading a news article about a police shooting of an unarmed black child versus spending time in the communities that are experiencing those losses while so few people listen and fewer still have the courage to do what is necessary for change. There's a difference between reading about the overwhelming number of children in the foster care system versus having a child in your home who believes they're alone and unlovable. There's a reason that people who have a transgender friend or relative consistently report less transphobic views. When we open ourselves to being present with other people and with the natural world, we expose ourselves to new understandings of human responsibility and meaning. Experience helps us push past preconceived notions. It empowers our rational thought centers to go beyond the surface and into the truth. So while our capacity for reason may make us smart, experience educates our emotions and makes us wise. My favorite is hope. Hope is a lot of things, but one way to understand it is as the belief in the plausibility of the possible rather than the inevitability of the probable. And that's a, that's a quote from Marshall Gans, but I got it by way of James Croft, if any of you are familiar with him. He's a great speaker on the topic of hope. Let me say it again. Hope is a belief in the plausibility of the possible rather than the inevitability of the probable meaning that what is most likely to happen doesn't have to happen. There's the possibility if we work really hard together, we can achieve the improbable. And cultivating this frame of hopelessness is a wonderful, inspiring feeling, but it actually isn't just a feeling. Hope is a complex motivational system that allows us to make meaning out of our experiences, to learn, and to successfully find opportunities to accomplish our goals. So by viewing the world optimistically, we actually stimulate the reward center in our brain and activate a physiological neurochemical process that makes us more effective at capitalizing on opportunities around us because we're more likely to look for and find those opportunities. And hope is very special, pleasurable, useful tool is very, very difficult to maintain. There is so much awfulness around us. And to make the world better, we have to look straight at that awfulness so we can see what it is and how to fix it. This can be overwhelming, which is why cultivating community is an essential humanist practice. And this photo is some of my people from the secular community in Arizona. The thing is, when we leave these safe spaces and go out there and fight for equality or ecological justice for basic human rights and dignity, 
it hurts. We're gonna get punched down and we're gonna watch people we care about get punched down. We need to have communities to come home to and by which to be nourished. So participating in communities like Atheists United is really critical to humanist practice. Now, as you're looking for resources for practicing humanist, humanism, I wanna talk a little bit about Foundation Beyond Belief, which is kind of like the center of compassion for the humanist movement and those who share our values. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, Foundation Beyond Belief was founded about 10 years ago to help inspire and focus charitable giving in the humanist community. We've evolved over the past decade and begun to really hone in on some specific sustainable development goals uh, to get closer to a world in which all people have access to life's basic necessities. So you can see here our brand new mission statement that we've just launched is concentrating on poverty and hunger, health and well-being, and uh, economic opportunity. We've been able to give more than $3 million to charities that share our humanist values, both in the United States and internationally. We've been able to support secular uh, disaster recovery all over the world, rebuilding homes and schools, uh, whole lives. We have a vocational training program in Ghana that gives students the skills they need to become tailors. And here you can see our current students modeling some of the dresses they've made. And I have to tell you, the way that this program transforms the possibilities for young people reminds me a lot of my own experience. Um, it didn't take a major financial investment in me to open the doors of opportunity in my life. I, I have no idea what the exact dollar amount people in my life invested to help me during the time that I was experiencing homelessness but it wasn't much uh, and it went so far. I mean, it's still going. For these folks in Ghana, it's about $500. An investment of $500 essentially provides a young woman a lifetime of financial security. It's really remarkable what we can accomplish together when we, when we take responsibility for improving the world. And we have a network of volunteer teams all over the globe that we partner with to encourage local service. This one is in the Philippines and they're doing a lot of incredible work for literacy. Uh, you may know that Atheists United is also one of our really active teams. So if you're doing any volunteer work with AU, you are part of this movement to build a more humanist world. Now, as you're working to cultivate hope and compassion in your life, I'd love for you to get involved in FBB if you're not already. You can text the letters FBB to 22828 to sign up for our email list and learn more about our work. Uh, I, I'll also give our web, our web address is foundationbeyondbelief.org and I'll, I'll have that up on the screen at the end of my talk. Um, but there are also a million other ways for you to practice humanism. The important thing about it, the way that it helps us confront darkness is through the active practice of it. Humanism is a practice that we have to apply in our everyday lives, that we bring with us into the world as we engage with it. The power of humanism is this action, this creative work that builds our lives around us with our own efforts together as an interconnected human family that weaves from nothing our sense of purpose and realizes goodness in an uncaring universe, that participates with others and pursues, rather than prays for, a more humanist world. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Great, awesome. If uh... We'll let that stay up on the screen for a little bit. I'll give you a first question to kick things off. Um, I really, really appreciate you sharing your story. I've, I've heard many of that before, but I'm glad others get to hear it and how uh, incredible your work and life story has been. But uh, I feel like humanism is often framed in individualist terms for a lot of people. And uh, there's a lot of us that work in organizational spaces and institutions, and we're trying to figure out and talk about what the future of kind of structural or institutional humanism would look like. And I'd love your 
thoughts on how we build uh, kind of sustainable structural humanism, um, given that uh, if we just function as individuals, I imagine it'll be a lot harder. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the great truths of the humanist, the human experience is that we're all so interconnected. So the, the idea of individualism is, is really, really fails. It, it's failed and philosophies that are based around it have not succeeded. And so we know that we have to, we have to work together. Um, and, you know, that's, that's one of the reasons that I love being involved in politics so much is that that's how we organize our morals as a, as a society. Uh, and, and I think that humanists have to be more involved in the political process in order for us to bring humanist values into the way that we organize our society. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, just getting more involved in politics, getting more involved in building your local community, because that community becomes a force in and of itself. Um, and I mean, I could give whole talks on structural humanism. I think, you know, we talk a lot about structural racism, you know, all of these institutional sexism uh, and the, the antidote to that is structural and institutional humanism. And so I, I really think that we have to bring that with us into our public lives and in, in the political process. Great, uh, you can get rid of the screen share. I'm gonna check out some of these questions here. Um, there was a question about the power of humanism um, and how that relates to atheists and atheism. Um, I, I can't get through a talk without this kind of question um, on humanism. What's the difference between atheism and humanism to you and how do atheists, whatever that means, and humanists work together? Are they the same? And, uh, and how do they maintain or not maintain separate identities? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure you've all heard this before, but atheism is really just the absence of belief in God. And, and I think that most humanists who have a naturalistic worldview are some brand of non-theistic. Um, although we heard your buddy Louie talk about his pantheism, and I think that there are, there are lots of um, sort of pantheistic or deist uh, worldviews that fit fine into humanism as well. The, the important aspect of humanism is that it doesn't rely on supernaturalism. So it's not so important whether or not you have a supernatural belief. It's what you think that means in terms of how you interact with the world. And for humanists, we, we don't rely on that. There's no divine power that's going to make change for us. We have to, we have to make change through human action. And um, atheists who want to make positive change will also know that. But an atheist doesn't necessarily care about positive change. They, it, the, the philosophy is just a lack of a belief in God. So um, there's obviously like a huge overlap between atheists and humanists in the movement, like the Venn diagram is really, um, but, but you can be a totally apathetic atheist who doesn't care about positive change. And, um, and a humanist is gonna be on a different side of that. But I, yeah, I mean, I think that there are good reasons to have the atheist identity, and I, I do use it a lot as a protest identity because we are living in a country that has so much religious power and privilege and that is causing harm. And so it's important to separate ourselves from that and call it out where it's where it's really wrong. But you can also do that as a person of faith. I mean, I know a lot of progressive people of faith who are calling out you know, white Christian nationalism um, really effectively from that position. And we have a lot of overlap with progressive people of faith as humanists too. I mean, if for, for progressive people of faith who aren't, who feel that uh, their faith requires human action rather than just waiting for God to do everything, um, who view themselves as, you know, tools of God's work, uh, I, I think you're going to see us doing a lot of the same work. And I think this is a really interesting question, and I'm curious about how maybe organizations like Atheists United, who historically have always um, been part of what the American atheist movement, which has been the representative of a lot of humanist values and structure um, in some ways, in some places. Um, and there's been different uh, definitions and of ideas around what atheism means in a larger sense. So I, like, I just got a, a comment. A, a lot of the founders of Atheists United subscribe to positive atheism, uh, which came from India and like is a much more 
active and there's values attached to it. And, and so um, the question would be like, how do you think atheist organizations interact with humanism or not, maybe historically and in our future? Because we're going through that question a lot right now um, about uh, what language, um, we have lots of identities within our own community because um, atheism is often such a large umbrella term um, in our movement, but also how we uh, like look at the future because we've gotten challenges uh, by a few people on our email list or Facebook when we dive into topics like white supremacy um, and like what values we attach and organize a community around using a label like atheism. Um, there are some that would argue we need to just define that as humanism or not. Does that matter? Has it always kind of overlapped? What are your thoughts? That's a huge uh. question. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't think that it is essential for positive atheist communities to call themselves humanist communities. I think that the values we share are going to be really similar and that you can talk about humanistic values without s defining yourself as a human. I mean, I just talked about my, you know, very religious parents having humanist values and uh, and I, I think that highlighting those values and giving them a basis is really important. So if you're if you're identifying yourself as an atheist or a positive atheist, atheist plus whatever, um, I didn't mean to sound dismissive when I was like whatever, but <laughs> um, then you need to explain how the values that you have come from that identity and have a really clear and consistent way of articulating what that means. But, but yeah, I mean, I think that there are a lot of, you know, people come to their life stances from a lot of different pathways and the identities that we choose mean things to us. And so it's telling somebody who really feels like an atheist and that feels true in a way that the word humanist doesn't resonate I don't think it's important to talk that person out of the word atheist. I think it's just important to, to help them articulate their values and to act them out into the world. Cool. There's a question about Foundation Beyond Belief um, and how it works with target groups. Uh, I think specifically they're asking about the Ghana program and if it's working kind of like the Peace Corps and employing locals. Uh, yeah, so the, the Ghana and, program has had yeah. a lot of evolution and this has been really cool, uh, like through experience and through our values. You know, it, it originally started as a service corps program that was similar to the Peace Corps and the, the hope was to develop something that would not have some of the same sort of like colonialist, you know, outsider coming in and telling people what's best um, and really trying to rely on local expertise. Um, but we found that there really wasn't a good way to bring in, it just is not an efficient use of resources to bring in outside American volunteers for long-term volunteer projects versus hiring local people to take care of their own communities. So while we, that was providing a really wonderful experience for Americans who could get to go over there and experience another culture, it wasn't what was best for the communities in Ghana. Um, now, there may be instances where there's a project that an expert is needed and there isn't somebody locally who has that expertise. And in those circumstances, we would um, definitely look at how we bring volunteers for, the, for that work but yeah we've shifted to to hiring local expertise and those programs are run by Ghanaians um now uh so there's been some interesting research that has come out recently by um like socioanalytica and uh American Human Association Foundation and Freedom from Religion Foundation talking about uh how much uh, the secular community kind of identifies on certain social issues. And uh, that research has been really fascinating because it shows that we're have like huge alignment, sometimes stronger alignment than even evangelicals have alignment on certain social issues. Um, and off of that, there's a question that asks if humanists can never be a strong political force like evangelicals. And I've heard that question in other ways kind of be like, do you think we could be a voting right. block? Yeah, or yeah. Pundits, pundits call it, yeah. 
What do you think? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that any uh, you know values-based community can be a voting block. We just have to grow. Uh, we're people who identify as atheists or humanists is, is pretty small right now. We do, uh, you know, have this huge growth in pe people who don't identify with religion at all. The nuns. That's a that's a large group. But um, but if they don't connect with our values and uh, come to our communities and participate in our work, we're not going to be able to be a voting block that, you know, that, that's not going to help to grow humanism. So we, we do have to figure out ways to outreach to those communities. Um, and, and I think, you know, a lot of our organizations are talking a lot about the lack of diversity in the movement and how do we get more diverse and how, I mean, we just have to go be present in the movements that, you know, that, that need liberation. Like we can't, we're not going to get black and Latinx people to come to our little meetings and sorry, I don't mean to call it a little meet, a little meeting, but, <laughs> but what is, what is attractive about this to them if we've never stood by them? I mean, we have to go and be present and, you know, build networks and connections with people. And, um, and, and I think update our values too. Like, you know, humanism is really Eurocentric and that's, we've, we've got a great tradition. We've learned a lot over thousands of years from, from great thinkers, but it's been really a European mindset. And right now there are a lot of liberation efforts that are happening that are drawing from you know, like uh, South American liberation theology, um, a lot of different, you know, African movements. And um, those are equally rich and perhaps more relevant to the times. And if we don't incorporate that into our humanism, we're going to become irrelevant very quickly. So I think that, um, you know, if we want to become a voting block, it means being present in the rest of the world, being real allies, um, updating our, our worldview and being open to change and growth. When you think about uh, communities, there's lots of humanist and atheist communities across the country and across the globe. Um, what do you think about I know you've spoken and visited many of them too. Um, what do you think about uh, the current level of activity and commitment to values and the potential of these communities? Well, I, I think there's tons of potential. Um, it, it's, you know, I mean, I think that a lot of the humanist communities that we've visited are, are mostly um, social groups and that's nice. I mean, I think we need that, you know, I, like a lot of the personal issues that I talked about at the beginning of my talk, you know, dealing with illness and um, depression and death. And we, we need just social communities that, that support us to, to handle those experiences as humans. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I feel like if you are, if you, if you actually believe what humanism says that, that human, uh, that, that progress requires human intervention, then having a social group is not enough, that you're not practicing humanism by only meeting socially. And, um, you know, and that's one of the cool things working with Foundation Beyond Belief is that we do have so many groups that are really engaged in um, service work in their communities. Um, and, and hopefully uh, we can help amplify that effort and, and coordinate better in the future so that, that we can have a broader impact. Uh, you mentioned at the top of your talk kind of how you even transitioned this uh, this talk from more academic to more storytelling and kind of building that compassion and experience, which are the methods you described into it. Um, do you think we do that enough in kind of uh, atheist and humanist movements, the speakers? Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, like you if know. you peruse the books on humanism, like there, you know, there, there are some memoirs and some, you know, but for the most part, it's all really heady, logical stuff. And that's important. And I love that stuff. I, I'll spend all day reading it, but the, you know, that's a pretty narrow, um, demographic that we're going to reach with those messages. And 
I don't think it's doing enough to inspire us to act. I don't think that we're doing enough. I think that we can give more and do more and do it more effectively. Uh, it, yeah, if we are more open to experiential learning versus just the logical ph philosophical stuff. Yeah. Uh, there was a question about um, how do we try to involve people, many of whom really like to be involved in community in some of these atheist and humanist communities, because most people haven't heard about them. Um, we even have a, a student on here who's in a class about non-religion right now, but has never really heard about these atheist organizations. Um, where is that disconnect and how do we use the methods of humanism to, to solve that? Yeah, I mean, we, we have to do a lot more marketing uh, and the internet makes that a lot easier. Um, and, and I think, you know, some of our groups are older and folks aren't, I mean, I even am running into this now, you know, my new executive director just asked us to get on TikTok and I'm like, I don't even, how do you talk? How do you TikTok? <laughs> I don't know what that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there, there, there's constantly new ways of reaching people that we need to be aware of. But as I said earlier, you know, we have to go be present with people. They're not going to know about us if we're not out there uh, in, involved in doing the work and being honest about who we are. So, um, so some of it's, you know, kind of the boring, like we need to run more Google ads campaigns or something. But some of it is, you know, like sh show up at your... Uh, your sanctuary city community meetings and um, open your homes to immigrant families and let people know that you're doing that because you're a humanist. Yeah. Um, there was one other question um, uh, about kind of atheism and humanism as language. Is atheism an unnecessary word for the purposes of making the world better? I don't think it is unnecessary in the United States today uh, and, and in many other countries that have sort of theocratic uh, leanings because again the uh, religion is such a force both uh, politically and in terms of people's understanding of what morality is here like there, there's faith and morality are used so interchangeably that we have to have language to explain that that isn't true for everyone and, and that we can be moral and we can reject theocracy. Um, so yeah, as, as a protest identity, I do think that atheism is important still. And maybe someday it won't be, or it'll evolve into something new. You know, as you were saying, like a lot of people identify with atheism plus that can turn into its own philosophy that can become more than what it is. And so uh, in the future, who knows what it's gonna look like, but yeah, I think it's an important protest identity still. Cool. All right, I believe that's the end of the questions I have in the chat. Um, is there any awesome work or project? Actually, no, before I say that, we have this really huge election happening. Uh, we can't ignore that for a second. Um, and I think a lot of people have been trying to think through what happens next um, and what is our place in all of that. Um, and I know I've personally been struggling with this all. I don't know if I'm going to be spending all of November on the streets protesting or hiding or uh, or what. And I'm I'm kind of curious how you. I see some I see some claps up there. Um, if like how can humanism uh, help us figure out what to do um, through such massive uncertainty, essentially. I feel like there's a lot of uncertainty we've been feeling for a while, but we're definitely going to feel some level of it if uh, our traditional ideas about how our democracy work seem to be fraying greater than they ever have. Um, and I'm curious if, you know, you started to think at all about how to use that toolbox to uh, help us get through it. Yeah, I mean, I primarily am, um, like my concern is around people who are already experiencing marginalization in various ways and like, you know, can that get worse and how can it get worse? And I think that like, again, because for me, humanism is such an action oriented 
worldview, I'm looking at how can I support those communities? What are they going to need? Um, and, you know, uh, building a sense of purpose around that. I, I, for me, I feel like humanism and uncertainty are really comfortable together. I mean, we are just as humanists and atheists willing to say we don't know to a lot of questions. We don't really understand how the universe started. We don't know what's gonna to happen to it. Um, we don't even really understand exactly how life starts. I mean, there's there's just a lot of stuff we don't know and we're, we're willing to just sit with that and um, keep working towards more knowledge. So um, so I feel like that's part of you know our, our everyday experience uh and and then again just knowing that there is so much power in one another and in ourselves so you know we our our species has survived holocausts and we've done it together and we've cared for each other during really awful stuff so we know we can and i hope we don't have to <laughs> yeah. i hope it gets a lot better soon um but I have a lot of hope in, in uh, human beings. Yeah. Well, thank you, Sarah. Uh, I, I hope you gave more hope to people today. Um, and yeah, thank you for joining us and, and sharing everything you did. Uh, I'm gonna stop the live feed here in a second. Uh, we're gonna move into um, kind of once the live feed's off, there can be any unscripted questions for Sarah. Uh, we have a little bit of Atheist United business to do uh, for our meeting of our membership. And uh, yeah, so if everyone wants to uh, thank Sarah right now, go ahead and uh, shake your hands a little bit in excitement. I'll end the live feed. Thank you. All right, the live stream should be stopped. Um, so we'll do a few minutes of kind of open questions or comments and then uh, yeah, we'll move into a quick comment from our board chair about our election. And then uh, Klaus is going to host the, the hereafter party with the godfather of fun, as he likes to say. Great. All right. So OK, are we, are we continuing to, re we're still recording? We're rec uh, yeah, I yeah, can okay. recording too. That's right. OK. There we go.